four. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? I had asked for an agenda item to bring up uh, a subject that didn't get put on, so I, I'm more than willing to do under board comment, or we feel like we should okay. make an item on either one. But yeah, I think board comment would probably be okay. place for that. Um, okay, consent agenda. Uh, does anybody want to make a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, August sixteenth? So moved. We have a second. I'll second. Okay. Hi, who first? Who was the first? Who was the second? I'm sorry. Uh, Chris uh, made the motion and Shannon seconded. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 You're uh, muted, Rodney, but take it your hand was an eye. Okay. Yeah, hi. Okay. Here we go. Okay. The minutes are approved. Um, do we have any public comments at this time? Okay. And we'll move on to board comments. Uh, yeah, so I had um, probably... <clears throat> Maybe for some of us, it's a little bit of a surprise, but I'd asked to put the um, topic of bullying and harassment um, out for discussion. And I know, you know, we have policies in place for it, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us in the room here understand the importance of bullying and harassment in schools. Um, but I'm sure there are individuals that may be watching tonight or will watch it on a video that, that may not understand. So. <clears throat> So a couple of things, uh, just so everybody understands, and this comes right, um, right from the government websites, 42% of students between the, age, between the grades of uh, fifth and ninth grade experience at least one form of bullying or harassment incident each day in school. Um, another number that was kind of shocking to me was 160,000 children a day in the United States do not go to school due to the fear of bullying and harassment. And then, you know, a very sad statistic is 71% of school attackers <coughs> were bullied in school and reported being victims of almost daily bullying in school. Um, some of the psychological facts with this age group that we're dealing with is, you know, bullying and harassment in schools increases in the late childhood. So. You get in the fifth grade area, um, and it peaks in the early adolescence, so ninth grade, we'll call it. Um, so specific, not to pick on Mr. Bradley, but a majority of it happens in the middle school, a little bit on the tail end of elementary, and a little bit at the beginning of the high school um, pieces of it. And typically, you know, this takes place in unstructured areas. So recess, lunch, in between classes, before or after school, and then most recently that we've experienced is social media, right? And that social media happens in all these, you know, what we'll call uh, unstructured settings. Um, and, and three reasons why bullying and harassment typically happens at school is <clears throat> due to insufficient or ineffective adult supervision, so during those times. And then uh, staff and or students have an, in an indifference or accepting attitude towards the bullying, so not agreeing you know, what is bullying? Um, and then, you know, in some cases, uh, no bullying prevention program in place, which, you know, we have a policy for bullying and harassment. So, um, and, and I think we can all agree that in order for students to learn, they need to have a safe and healthy environment. Um, and some more statistics, students who are victims of bullying are less likely to participate in the classroom. They tend to be labeled slower learners and or require extra help to complete tasks. And I think we've kind of all seen that with uh, either our own, our own children or students in the classrooms. You know, these students often uh, go on to be underachievers and perform at a lower level. Um, they also experience a lot of uh, days out of school. Um, 
uh, of course, through this whole thing, I was kind of asking myself the question, you know, looking at the testing scores, if you look at the testing scores, you know, fifth grade through ninth grade is where our testing scores go down and then they start to come up again. And it, it kind of correlates almost identical with the bullying and harassment peaks that we see with our students. Um, I know we have policies in place, just like every school in the country does because it's law. But I guess I have some proposed solutions that I really would like, you know, this isn't just the board, but it's just, uh, I, I feel typically if it comes from a board level down, um, you know, it, it comes with a form of support um, for <coughs> all of us below. But um, even though we have policies, you know, the removal of cell phones during school day, um, especially, I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of elementary school kids that do. But, it, you know, elementary, especially elementary and middle school, I think, would be effective. I know we have the policy, but I know there's kids having lots of access to those. Um, I think we should have a strict social media um, at schools. So, you know, restricted access to use those um, in and around of our schools. Um, I think that, um, you know, that bullying harassment also also usually is paired with um, when the structural setting of our schools um, <clears throat> isn't at its peak performance being that if there is disruptive behavior going on in class and students are more apt to want to join in with the disruptive behavior and when that disruptive behavior isn't addressed it tends to lead to more behavior which um, often leads to uh, bullying and harassment um, you know, looking through, um, looking through our um, proposed um, in, in the school handbook, um, you know, punishments for, for issues, you know, we, we talk about restorative justice for, you know, talking through why we're doing things and how can we um, do things better uh, going forward. And I think that's great. Um, but I also think that there's a very fine line between, you know, that first time that somebody's doing having an offense versus that repeat offender and getting them under control quickly and it and it seems like from the experience that i've seen in this age group that we allow this behavior to manifest too long um, and then it becomes a, a greater bigger issue that we have to deal with um, and i and again i think that just comes you know a more strict classroom behavior policies um, and, it, and lastly, and, and Owen and I were talking about it, is just, you know, in order to make this work, you know, I think we have to empower everybody in the process. So, you know, students, teachers, administrators, volunteers, parents, the empowerment of, you know, say, it's, you know, say, stop, do. So if you see something out there, point it out. If you're, uh, if you're a student and you see someone doing something and you say, hey, that's not appropriate, or a teacher in the classroom immediately addressing that, you know, we can get those um, under control. So, and, and for anybody that's kind of maybe a little shocked on why is he bringing this up today is, you know, this has been a, uh, obviously there's a, a theme throughout the United States at this age level, but we have most recently um, dealt with some, I would say, severe cases of bullying and harassment at the the middle school, high school level um, um, that just happened um, without any details. Um, and uh, I, I guess on my end, I would just like to see us come together as a collective whole, really, really enforce the policy and any punishments that would come before it. So, um, again, just on the record that this isn't nowhere, you know, a direct. Um, point at Owen it just happens to be the age group is you know mostly middle school a little bit on the elementary school and a little bit on the high school level where we find this so um, how we can get this better under controlled so our students can learn um, you know I think would be something in the right direction for us so I don't know any comments on anybody on the board or how they feel about it or um, so, uh, just from kind of our role in this thing, you know, like, 
I do think the board's kind of role is to set policy and then the administration is to implement policy. So, you know, I think if, if there are things that you think we can do to improve the bullying policies, that'd be one side of thing, things. And then the other side would be, you know, you know, giving feedback to the administration so that they, you know, this would be something that we kind of would do in, in the um, evaluation of how Jamie's doing and kind of the things that we wanted to focus on um, with the implementation of things. So you know, I think it is good for him to get feedback on, on what needs focus. Um, so I guess like, are there policies you think that we should change um, from the board perspective? Okay. Well, so, I, you know, looking through the policies, I think you know the policy is pretty sound as, as um, you know, majority of the schools' policies are um, through the mandates. Um, I, I think I would like to see a, a swifter, uh, stricter guideline for dealing with behaviors. Um, I, from looking through our policy right now, we're more, we're more dealing with this on a. Um, on a restorative justice end of things rather than a swift um, swift punishment end of things. Um, Stopping the behavior first and then... Right. You know, and and it, it's difficult because, you know, for some individuals, you know, a restorative type uh, works for people and in some cases it doesn't. And, you know, some kids, you know, a more, you know, um, gavel type response is... Um, is um, is quicker to um, to get. So I, uh, I I think on my end of things, and I know it's nothing at the board level. You know, we do policy, but I think just you know, I think us just maybe reiterating that you know the board has um, you know the backs of the administration to do everything in their toolkit to bring. And, and again, it's not at just our school. I mean, there's all these schools are dealing with the same age group of, you know, pre-puberty, post-puberty issues that come with it. And social media is running out of control right now, as we're seeing. And But, you know, what can we do to empower our administrators and our administrators to empower our teachers and our teachers to empower our students mm -hmm. to get this under control? And so. Shannon? <laughs> So I guess what I'm hearing is there's a concern from a board level about bullying um, and really how our policies are being implemented. And I think that's just a question that we have for our, our principals and, and Jamie, and I would love to hear their response, but I'm not sure other than that um, where to go aside from just asking them how we're responding to this very challenging issue. Sure. So, you know, we're working all the time to strengthen our, our behavioral supports. And, and part of that is proactive, but it's also response to misbehavior in that it's predictable <laughs> and clear and that in general, folks really understand that when you don't meet the school norms, which is part of restorative practice is that you have classroom and building wide norms that that there are really like agreements is that if you don't follow the norms or agreement that there would be some type of response cost or consequence right and so part of that sometimes is having to to make it right now I agree with you that there's like there's the restorative piece but that there also that there there needs to be clear response cost um, and I, I use the term response class because I think that when you're responding to misbehavior, sometimes there's a cost to it. Mm -hmm. And so that's work that we're doing. And I, and I would also make certain that the board knows that our, we are tomorrow I have my whole administrative team and all my designees for Title IX harassment um, investigators in training tomorrow. Um, it, I believe it's tomorrow, right? And we hit yeah, HHB. Yeah, in three, three years, and we hit That's HHB it. last week. So we are doing work in this as well to just make certain that our systems are fine-tuned 
and that we have c consistent reporting mechanisms too. They're actually, we're, I'm working right now on reporting forms that look the same across all the member schools of the SU so that it's really clear how that process works. Um, I think sometimes we don't get the information um, that we need to, to open an investigation as swiftly as I'd like to. Um, I think part of that is folks not knowing who to report to or where to go. And so we need to do a better job with that. And so I would tell you that I definitely think that there's work to be done in this area, but that we that work is underway and that we're trying to, to get better at it. Um, I'd also offer the board that I'd be more than happy to have our student support team come do a presentation on the work that we're doing. Um, I think that that work looks different at each grade level based on what's developmentally appropriate. Um, but in regards to strengthening our system of supports, I'd be happy to have the board get a presentation from our system supports coordinators um, in the administration on the work that's on the way there. Um, and, what, and how that looks different based on what's developmentally appropriate at each level. Because I think elementary and middle and high school looks different. Okay, yeah, it would be great to get a... Yeah, no, I think for a future agenda item, yeah, we, we can talk about we that. We do present the data. Yeah, but I think we, we can, can talk about that a focus it. on yeah. what do we do with that data sure. and talk about the work that's underway universally. And I think, level. you know, we kind of look at the data as a whole mm -hmm. and that includes, you know, other disciplinary things that aren't just sure. going to focusing on, yeah. you know, that one issue would be helpful too. And I know in order to combat the, the total issue you need you know complete buy-in from all parties right and i know this you know the school is only half of the the piece and the you know, home life is the other half is there any is there any piece to what the administration does that links the parents and the two you know any type of bullying or harassment training or pieces like that no, you it's, know it's a great question chris so Part of what I think is the work of the community schools grant too is to start back up with having regular, like informational. We've done this in the past, even under my tenure, where we were offering like, what does math look like in WRVSU? What does literacy look like in WRVSU? I think it can be also like, what does HHB investigations look like in WRVSU? How do you report it? Like, what are next steps? Like, what is our process and protocol? I've, I've been kind of holding off on doing that HHB one until I know that we're coordinated in how we approach it across the schools. Um, but I definitely think we need to get back to having those monthly informational opportunities for families. Um, and having them both in person and virtual, because I think some families, virtual just works better. I, I would recommend that if, you know, put it in plain language, I'm not sure yeah. people show up for an HHB. No, yeah, yeah right. But, <laughs> Um, I guess the other question would be, um, would some sort of electronics in the classroom policy from the board be helpful, or is that more of an administration decision? About well, you know, it's, it's so we just took on social media right. um, for staff. That's a focused staff policy. Um, I've talked at the policy committee, and it actually was, it was raised by some boards and policy committee members about how do we approach this for students? And my, I'm gonna be gathering kind of a temperature check from that committee to say, is that something we wanna pursue? Um, you know, I think in general at the high school, um, we, Mr. Thomas can talk about the, okay. the procedure they use. I think that we have tightened up on the use of cell phones at the high schools. I think having a policy to back the why we're doing it is helpful. Well, I think currently now it's, it was written well in the, the handbook, and so we just started following it. So the first day of school, I told the students that there'll be no phone use in the classroom, that you need to be locked in and focus. You know, too much of education is you're here and not focused looking up. And so, and I told the staff was there, and I'd already talked to the staff, but I pointed to them with the student body there, and I said, and so if there is any phone use, the staff will be in trouble. So students, be aware of that. And I've caught two people using their phones. And it was at the end of class one time, and it was because the game got canceled. So one of the players was, and both times I called that individual out in the hallway. And then I called the teacher out. And, and the kids are in there looking. And it's been, I think, amazing. Because I go by, as 
so often in the halls and I'm looking in the classrooms. I like feel like a little, like, all right, no one's on their phones. They're all looking up. And I've seen those two people all, all year. And we just had a, meet, a faculty meeting today and talked about that. And one of the staff said, yeah, but, you know, it was always the rule, but now we're following it. So I think that's good. Good for you. AARP just had a, an article on, on kids and what's going on and lives of kids, and part of that is that social media thing. So they're allowed to use their phones in, in the hallways, but they don't because it's three minutes, they're getting their books and they're going to class, but during lunch I see them out, and that's about the only time in after school. So I'm excited. Okay. Right. Um, unless anybody has any other comments, we'll move on to the uh, No Celebration of Learning this month. Um, it will be back rolling in October. Yeah. Right. And the exciting thing is, I don't know if the principals, I have certain of your faculty reaching out to me to get on the agenda, which awesome. is, is exciting. Yeah. So, good. We'll have a good, great, good, some good ones coming up. Now we're on to you, Jenny. So sorry about the delayed report. Mm. Um, I was traveling, uh, but no excuse. I try to always have the reports ahead of time. So you have the report in hand. Uh, some highlights. Um, I mentioned it, we, we lost an interventionist late um, at the Royalton campus in the school year, and so we've been trying to hire for that position, haven't been able to do it. We also had a hire that was going to be a really strong third grade teacher, and they never moved to the state. And um, so that was challenging, so we had to move an academic interventionist in. We do have licensed teachers in all of our classes um, at the elementary level, but I also it's another it's a good problem to have but I highlighted in my report we have a very large kindergarten class right now at South Royalton that we hadn't planned for um, and typically we if we had a bigger bench with interventionists we would have moved to having two kindergarten classes but due to the fact that we had a late resignation um, by Amy Bodwin and then um, the teacher who didn't end up coming to state we found out about that literally two weeks before we opened um, it's made it challenging and so we're looking to push more staff in to support that kindergarten class and think outside the box of how we make certain that that experience is really strong. Um, and so I expect that that's going to get better and better as, as we go here at the start of the school year. And so just so the board knows, that's 24 students in that kindergarten class, which is large for a kindergarten. I will tell you that last year in one of my districts we had 23 just because there was no actual other classroom space even in that building, um, and they tend to run larger cohorts. So I just, I try to be really transparent, know that that's a work in progress and we're working on it to, to strengthen it um, in that setting. So I wanted to highlight that in my report. The other um, things that I wanted to highlight in the report, and we will talk about it at the full board meeting, is that this Lincoln discussion, and I've been communicating directly with board chairs, um, is growing momentum um, in the sense that they have made it really clear to the Vermont, uh, the, the state, Vermont State Board of Education that who, just so the board knows, has the authority to change the borders of supervisory unions. That, that lies in the Vermont State Board's authority. And so Lincoln has um, requested uh, formally that after they've done all their explorations, they, they believe that WRBSU is best suited to support their district. Um, as you know, Ripton had come to us last year looking to join our supervisory <coughs> union um, with the same argument around that we have like member districts, that they're small, um, and that they are adjacent to us. Geographically, our SU already is very large and getting east to west in this yeah, state is really difficult. Um, and so I had shared a letter and shared it with the full board um, that just, again, reiterated our, our sentiment last year around Ripton and that that continues to be with the sentiment from Lincoln. Uh, the state board chair had reached out to me um, and asked that, that we come with representation um, to the next um, state board meeting so we will have legal representation and board members present um, and to, to plead our case around why we feel like we're a right size fit at this moment in time. Um, you know, and one of the things that, that I spoke to in the letter um, that I believe you've all seen or received a copy of a while ago now, a few weeks ago, is I just think we're finally starting to get our business in order in some places, and I don't want to lose momentum on that. Um, 
And I've said that directly to Lincoln's board chair um, in a meeting with them. And um, also, you know, reiterated to them that, you know, that we're, we're down a person right now in the business office. I mean, the business office is a two-man um, show right now as far as accounting and, and payroll and, and budgeting. So, um, so I've said all that, but yet their sentiment remains. So my sense is, is that the state board is going to listen to us and uh, Rutland Northeast, which is Brandon area uh, supervisory union, and then the Lincoln School District plead their cases, and um, I haven't seen the agenda yet. It hasn't come out. I'm, I'm looking forward to see if there's possible action actually warned for that meeting. My sense is that it will actually, they'll probably listen and then have a special meeting to take action soon. Because uh, whatever supervisory union that they join would then be responsible to start working with Lincoln School District around budgeting for next year. Because um, this has to take effect by July 1. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's, um, it's a pretty significant decision at the state board, you know, and, and geographically, even from like where we sit right now to Lincoln, there's no easy way to get there. I worked in that supervisory union. It was my first teaching job at Bristol, um, and Lincoln's even farther. So I, I'm really concerned about the geographical nature of the request. Does the state take into account the geographical nature? Or my sense is that they're going to. Um, one of the things that um, Lincoln's arguing is, is that they believe that they should be in an adjacent SU, and Granville has a sliver mm -hmm. that actually up in the hills touches Lincoln. Um, and so I, I do know that, and it's in their minutes in, in presentation of the past, that, that their argument is that, that we are close mm -hmm. um, compared to other SUs. Because like traveling-wise, you would think that the Brandon area would be an easier travel because it's on that side of the mountain, right? And so in all the other adjacent um, educational organizations are unified districts. And so the state board does, doesn't appear to have an appetite to want to break up a unified district into a supervisory union. Yeah. As Act 46 had worked hard to have these merge unified districts. Um, and so that, that is an argument that doesn't necessarily support our case. Um, because when you look at like Harwood Unified Union School District touches them too, um, but they're a unified union school district. Mount Abe is a unified union school district. That's why they broke off. Um, and um, when you look at C CVU is a unified school district in Hinesburg, which geographically, uh, and also Addison Central, Middlebury is a unified union school district. They have not just approached RSU, they approached, I know, multiple um, other supervisory unions or unified union school districts. Um, but it seems that they settled that they had decided that this was the best fit for them. Hmm. Ripped in as an update seems that they, they are moving toward a vote. I don't think it's happened yet, maybe it did, um, to actually j rejoin Addison Central Unified Union School District. They decided hmm. that it made more sense to rejoin uh, that Middlebury area and Unified Union School District. So that's no longer a topic of conversation, but Lincoln kind of, it came wicked quick too. I had no awareness that this was a, something they were pursuing until like June when the state board reached out to me. So mm -hmm. and then it's really picked up steam. And they were originally in the CBU? They were originally with Mount Abraham. Oh, Mount Abraham. So Mount Abraham has had a union high school for years. Um, and so it was much like U32. There was uh, singleton districts at the elementary level, but then they fed into a unified union high mm -hmm. school board. When they merged, all those elementary boards went away and they became one operating um, pre-K-12 district. And I, you know, the sense that I have is that Lincoln's concern and why they broke off was that they were worried about um, having that larger organization close their small school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions for Jamie? Okay. Principals. The you received the report. Um, Mrs. Bowen is supervising or enjoying the open house tonight in the Bethel Elementary, and um, so she doesn't join us. But 
new addition to our whole report is photos. Yeah, I like those. Yeah, that's all the new guy. Let's go. Cool. Giving us pressure. <laughs> it's good. Picture tells a thousand words. Right. Yeah, yeah. It just right. Turns out that uh, the middle school didn't have any photos available at the time of press, so we'll, we'll get better next week on that. Yeah. But just, I think we can hit that first goal, all three of us. We all focused on universal, um, going back to behavior and saying, let's reset, let's restart, and review. And I think Jeff gets that restart because he's brand new, but we also did it right down to the basics. It was 101. And it, it went really well. That was a faculty meeting ago, or the half day that we just had. Yeah. yeah. And you'll see some nice stuff in there. Jeff, you want to add anything? Yeah. To that so uh, one of the things we talked about was, uh, you, you know, kids seem to harass or bully when there's no teachers around. So one of the things we're doing, and I have some pictures of our staff, is in the hallways now mm -hmm. between classes. I know a lot of stuff happens <clears> in between <throat> classes, and the. Almost every teacher is outside their classroom, so they're looking at students, they're having conversations with students, they're preventing them from being on their phones because they're having those conversations. I think that's such an important piece. And we talked yeah. about this, where like, I don't know, at your house, when somebody comes over, you probably don't sit on the couch, right? You're, you're at the door, you greet them. When they leave, you say goodbye. So that's one of the things, there's that w welcoming you know, that they do, but it's being in the hallway, it's being that proactive stuff. So that's kind of an important piece, I think. And again, I think if you, if we, if we stop thinking about harassment and bullying and start thinking about community, mm -hmm. a lot of that goes away. And so we're really focusing on community. We're doing a lot of community stuff in our, like for example, like a, a girl sc scores her first goal in soccer, I blast her locker, I put a sign up, I put a balloon up, first goal, congratulations. It just builds that community. People see that. We had a girl the other night, uh, Tanner scored a goal, and I didn't get a chance to put a sign up that morning because we had an assembly with Adam and this and that, and I saw her when she walked in. I said, don't go to your locker yet. Go to the assembly because I'll have time in between to do that. That's and great. she's like, as soon as she scored, she's like, oh, I can't wait to get my locker blasted. Oh. So we're building community, awesome. and I think you know, it's like you know, one, one student at a time, but to see that, and to have that feeling. The other day our faculty went out after a faculty meeting to support the soccer team and it was amazing all the emails that I received about, wow, it was great to have you. Coaches sent me a note. You know, they were there five minutes. Our, our faculty meeting ended at 4.25 and then at 4.30 they were there and all we did was a couple cheers, you know. Some left, some stayed. So I think that's making a difference in, in our community. Thank you. Did somebody's hand go up? Yeah, Tammy said the principal's report was locked, so we'll have to change the settings on that. I can do that. It might be anyone outside the SU can see type setting. Okay. Another thing is, as pride in their school, though, so we did, you know, we've done a lot of outside stuff. The parking lots have just been painted, repainted, freshly painted, so that people know where to park and, and there's no lines that are like so bare that you can't see them. And again, that's that pride in the school. We're having students uh, choose their parking spots in the high school and they can decorate their own spots, and it's theirs for the year. So yes. that was another thing, go community. Can, can I, sorry, I wanted to jump in. The parking lot made me think of this, and I should have mentioned it during my report. Um, I have met, as you know, we had this wastewater permitting issue. I've met with the architect. I've, we've received um, preliminary approval that we're gonna be able to deal with the wastewater all completely um, in that back parking lot um, of the, school so there was a there was a, a wastewater permit that hadn't been completed when the new addition happened at the south royalton school the good news is the state's given us approval to move in this direction it's going to be cost effective and we should be able to take care of it this coming summer yes um, so that's good news and it doesn't result in us needing to pursue any adjacent landowner um, access right? i can work from so it's good okay and i can Parker's going to make that public, yep, that perfect. document. It's a PDF, so it's locked in its own way. But um, goal two is, um, oh, help me with that, Jeff. Pathways, personal Pathways. Oh, yeah. So we're happy to, to announce Mr. West is running our uh, middle school pathway program. And he has a little blurb in there that's hyperlinked. It's really good. And uh, what a great asset for us to have him. And your folks over at the high school? Yeah, you know what I'm finding is I'm finding a lot of students that dropped out of school are coming back and wanting their diploma, and so we're finding ways to 
reach their, I mean, they're close to graduating, so, you know, um, w our work-based learning program, kids are going out and working and getting their, you know, able to get their degree, and I think that's pretty exciting. And uh, uh, so, Jeff Clayton is new, he's taking Mary Waterman's place, and he's starting to make some connections and moving kids around, and so, it's, uh, you know, it's funny, because I, I, I talk about this, and I t uh, first day of school about, like, you know, I drew a picture of a school with the box and then the roof, and that box like some people don't fit in the box and that's okay and so we have to have offers that are outside the box for our student body and so we're finding ways to, to for people to fit outside that box feel comfortable and enjoy what they're doing so our, our um yeah our uh, uh, flexible pathways coordinator is doing a great job in our student body. yeah so let's see what else uh the community outreach uh, Andrea has had um, her open house tonight, but they also had an ice cream social at both campuses. And um, at the middle school, what did we write about? We wrote about um, the, that we're happy to get families back here, and we're going to do more and more of that. That point that um, Mr. Canarni made that we're talking about with our Act 70, 67 coordinator, Mary Michelle, having a monthly uh, community meal. and focus with families and have either an open agenda or topic. And we talk about cybersecurity because we know so many kids get on the internet and they're unsupervised and there's a lot of danger out there. We've talked to the state police about that and trying to think about how we might bring them in without scaring people but showing the real danger in that. What's going on at the high school with community connection? Yeah, so um, everything. everything. So this uh, this weekend is our um, homecoming. We have a homecoming dance on Friday. Saturday is the the games. It's uh, four thirty is the boys and the girls play under the lights at seven thirty. They're playing Lee, uh, Rivendell. Yeah. Yes. So it's not a rival bonfire. Yeah. And the bonfire at the end. And, um, we have a, a dunk tank. We have uh, a sumo wrestlers thing. We have the bass fishing team coming down and you know casting with kids. And uh, we have the golf team shipping for prizes and stuff. It's, it's going to be like like a regular high school homecoming this year, so I'm really excited about Nicely that. Done. And we're gonna bring a lot of people from the community in. They're making, you know, the boosters are doing a great job of cooking, making food, and we're gonna have hot food and hot cider, and it's gonna be a great evening. So everyone's welcome. Friday night? Uh, Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And then I'll just add, uh, Jeff and I met with the music boosters and performing arts boosters and had a nice meeting a week ago, and they're, going, they're creating a video to highlight the work that we do in the performing arts. Um, that we can also use for outreach um, as we start to really r ramp up and uh, we'll talk about that at the task force, our recruitment um, opportunities for the district. And um, they're looking to, uh, as a future and agenda item, get on in November, yeah. that we talked about, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that they could share that video and talk to the board about the work that they're doing as far as fundraising and trying to pursue this concept of expansion with our performing arts um, opportunity off the front of that old gym. Um, and so we'll start those conversations at the board level too in November. Somebody have any questions for the principals? All right, thank you guys. Here. So you have my report. The auditors are in our office this week doing the fiscal year 22 audit for all seven of our entities. We will be fiscally and programmatically monitored by the Agency of Education on our federal emergency fund grants. Our first round of documentation is due to them on September 30th. And then on October 7th, they'll report back to us as to the expenditures that they want to look at in more detail to make sure we're following federal procurement and cost allowability in conjunction with what's allowed in the grant. And then they'll be in our office November 1st and 2nd to report on their findings. On the school food authority side, uh, the first round of the fresh fruit and vegetable grant our schools didn't qualify for because we didn't meet the 50% free and reduced percentage requirements. So when there's additional funds available, the state will go down to the next level. So Bethel qualified in the second round. So we are in the process of submitting our application for the Bethel school. And then hopefully if there's more funds, then they will drop down 
a little bit further and maybe some of our other schools will be eligible. With the fresh fruit, or sorry, the free and reduced applications, the Agency of Education put out um, late last week some marketing materials and some informational materials and they're also doing advertising in the papers and on local TV channels um, to fill out the application and send that notification out to families um, because most schools in the state of Vermont, this is our last year to collect free and reduced applications because of the program that we have to switch to in order to be fully funded by the state. So um, I reached out to Kate McLean and our food service managers and our administrative assistants with that information and asked them to get a push out to all families for that to see if we can get some more applications in before our October 1st reporting deadline. So hopefully we'll see some more participation there. And then lastly, I provided to you in my report my fiscal year 22 uh, general fund projections and I set the expenditure side of the report up to be basically the way you see it in your audit as well so that to start getting that um, consistency in the way that everything is rolled up in the financial reports so overall um, a lot of the areas that we have savings on in FY22 um, were offset by what we were able to cover under our ESSER II funding. Um, a, a lot of our technology we were able to get covered under ESSER II rather than in our local budget. Same thing with um, our interventionists, their salary and benefits we were able to offset with the federal funding. And then um, a lot of the new math materials that are out in the classroom, we were able to actually pay for that with our ESSER II funding, so that didn't come out of the general fund. And then, um, a lot of the professional development that our staff has participated in um, that we've been reporting on for the last year was able to be covered under ESSER II. So that's helped substantially in our general fund savings. So on the expenditure side, right now the projection is a surplus of $892,865. And then Parker, if you can move to the revenue page. We had some students enroll later in the year, um, so we got some additional tuition revenue in both uh, secondary and preschool. So that helped um, on the revenue side. So we have um, projected o just over 33000 of additional revenue versus what was budgeted for. So overall right now, we have a surplus projection of $926,478. So as you recall, with the fiscal year audit, um, any additional adjustments that need to be made, those will be done. But also um, the assessments for the supervisory union and the child nutrition program have not been in, uh, factored into this yet. And with the child nutrition program, that was a look back for FY22 based on what the cost was versus what we would be assessing out. So that will have an impact on what your total overall uh, general fund balance will be at the end of the fiscal year. So that all comes together as we complete the FY22 audits. So if there's any questions. <clears throat> yeah, I think and I'm new to the school board, but I've done quite a bit of budgeting for decades. And I think the thing that continues to be alarming for myself is, is how drastically our budget changes from estimated versus actual from year to year. And, and instead of having a nice bell curve, we have these really jagged peaks and valleys of, of deficits versus surpluses. And, and when, you're, when you're operating a budget in that nature, you miss out on a lot of opportunities. So for instance, <clears throat> you know, if you're operating in a surplus, then you're missing out on opportunities of things that you could have done inside that budget you're not taking account for that. Um, or the opposite, if you're doing deficits, then you're, you're missing out on other opportunities. So, you know, I, I know that <clears throat> the school budget is a little more difficult because there are pieces of it that we don't have a lot of control or don't have, <clears throat> you know, 100% uh, numbers on before. So, you know, like you were just saying that there's pieces of this that we thought maybe we had to cover that now the state covered or another identity covered. Well, I, I think the other part of it is that you know, we don't want to take out something from our budget that we're just covering for this one year with one grant and then have to put it 
Yeah, and one thing we kind of purposely we did like budgeted as a regular year, and then mm -hmm. whatever we got from the government would kind of be, you know. So strategically, if I can add, yeah, go ahead. as a board, when we were building the last two budgets, we knew we had ESSER funds that we could use because ESSER 1 and 2 allowed us to supplant, but we didn't want to take that out of the local budget when we knew we would still need those resources and supports and services for kids. But we also knew we had these significant capital improvements that we were going to need to do. Mm -hmm. And so the grant allowed us to cover those interventions and supports knowing full well that we were projecting we'd have surpluses, one, to pay off the debt that we incurred and not have to go to the voters to pay off the debt. And then two, knowing that we had significant um, deferred maintenance that we would need to tackle. One of the real positive things which, that, which we wouldn't know f for certain is that we were able to s secure an additional 1.5 million in ARPA funds, ARPA ESSER funds, to do some of the work across the SU that didn't allow, isn't forcing us to totally tap into ESSER 3 to do those projects, which means what it'll allow us to do is possibly do some more expanded work, like EEI presented the other, the last month. Once we have a hot, hard number here, we may be able to tackle some more work in Royalton that we weren't planning on. Um, now that we have, we, we know that we have our ESSER funds to cover some costs in other districts as well. So I just, I, I hear what you're saying. I think what it is is it's on us as administration and board to make certain we're communicating with our with our citizens and constituents. Like, it's not surprising to me that we're rolling out a surplus here. Like that was intentional so that we could use that surplus to do this deferred maintenance that we haven't been able to tackle yeah. in years. Well, um, and we talked about that through the budget process. Yeah. Now, so we didn't want to, you know, like have the the tax rates go yes. cease on because you know took all this money out of the budget that we were going to have for the grant, but then the grant goes away and the taxes go up 30 cents. You know? right. yep. So it was kind of a combination of those two things. But I think we have to keep explaining it. Right. right. Well, I, I would say as a, a general citizen that a majority of people don't understand that. So when they see, sure. you know, you're giving us back 8 cents, but now the next year you're asking us for 4 cents, you know, and it's going up and down, up and down, rather than, you know, you're staying with a two cent curve or something like that. Um, so the other question I had just from not having looked at this before, so the the audited um, 19, 20, 21, are those cumulative balances or are these per year balances? So what kind of snapshots at that. They're cumulative. They're cumulative. So as of twenty one as of twenty one we had that surplus. Yeah, so each year with no other deficits. Yeah, each year at okay. the end of the close of your fiscal year, any surplus or deficit is rolled into any prior year surplus or deficit. So when you have a surplus like we did in twenty one, we were able to offset the deficit in the general fund in twenty. So we didn't have to go out to taxpayers and ask the taxpayers to cover that deficit in your budgets. Yeah, but 19, Tara, that's the audit deficit for that year. Yeah, yes, 20, so, so yes. it is a snapshot. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is if we have a, a deficit sheet here of 19 and 20 at, you know, uh, $850,000, we then, then that 21, we had 1.3. Does that mean yeah. we have half a million dollars as a balance right now? No, or, the board that so the board paid off those two. Yeah, and then at what was left over that one point three when the budget was approved this spring, we set aside money in the capital reserve funds. And Tara, and that's what okay. the voters approved. How much was it, Tara? So at the end of FY twenty one, we had an unassigned fund balance, which is what we can use to offset as offsetting revenue or to put in reserve funds was seven hundred twelve thousand seven hundred and eighty one dollars. Mm -hmm. So of that, and I can give you this, Chris, because I have this. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just trying to yeah. just wrap my head around. So this. of this, um, we used two hundred thousand in the fiscal year twenty three budget as offsetting revenue, and then we put two hundred and fifty thousand. And so this was on your actual <coughs> warning, and the communities mm -hmm. voted on it. In each of the Royalton and Bethel building reserve, reserve funds. funds. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so when we build the budget this coming year, that's what the board's going to have to wrestle with. Like out of this, once that we have an audited surplus, how much are we using as revenue versus how much are we putting in reserve funds? Right. And the big moving piece in, in school district taxation is the yield. 
mm-hmm. which we don't control. And right? CLA. And yeah. so afterwards, yeah. And so that's what, but they'll give us projections, and when the tax rates go up and down all the time, a big piece of that is the yield that's coming out of Montpelier where that mm-hmm. really drives that as well. So you try to balance that too. Yep. And we had a really good yield this year. Right. So we put a lot more in reserve funds. Right. Okay. okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, the one thing to keep in mind, this doesn't include uh, food services. Correct. As well, so we, that's a separate fund. Yeah, so they're an enterprise fund rather than a general fund in your budget. So because they actually make, they can make a profit. And if they have a deficit, the general <laughs> fund, right. Food service doesn't make the a je- profit. The, well, they had my 60 bucks for three years. Now. <laughs> 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 no they it's all the interworkings of the funds. Yeah. They can run a deficit. <laughs> Perfect. They're gonna be positive. Yes, of course. <laughs> all right, does anybody have any uh, further questions for Tara? All right. Um, I think Jamie already spoke. Yeah, to sorry. The I update on Lincoln. Yeah. That's well, fine. <laughs> um, just ahead of the game. All right. Then we'll move on to reading number two of the policy committee: um, social media and verification of student residency for tuition payment policies. So um, policy two won't really impact you as a district, right? But our policy on policies is that the SU adopts in all member districts. So right, we would still put it in front of you for adoption. Just like GHUD adopts our other operating policies. I mean, to some extent, it affects us because if we want to receive tuition, we, we got to work sure with the other yeah. receiving, mm-hmm. yes, sending districts. Yeah. This is an annual, this is a one time form though, and really, we, I talked to Sharon, we will leverage it for those students who, uh, for example, if it was a student that attended Sharon and was in ninth grade and moved in then we would work, Rudd High School would work with Sharon Elementary to get the affidavit completed. Because we haven't ever laid eyes on the student. And what we were finding in those situations, there was a higher likelihood that it could be a second home um, in some of our, our tuition main districts. Um, there was some concern around second, home, second homeowners, not primary residencies, claiming it as a primary residence and then using it to get school choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where this, that's what necessitated us to pursue this policy, was mostly that scenario. Okay. Um, have people had a chance to look at these? Does anybody have any comments or discussion on this? So I'll be looking to adopt these next time? Yeah, they're, they're, they're already, Christie's already got them worn for the paper, for the, so that it'll go in the Herald for warning for adoption next month. Good. And the flag policy, the proposed flag policy, is going to be in front of the SU board uh, for our first reading this coming, well, next week. And then we'll go in front of the local districts for readings next month as well. Okay. Sounds good. <coughs> All right. Uh, task force updates. Um, let's start with the finance committee. We met on Thursday um, and was Jen just over things very briefly, but didn't go into anything in particular. So that was a pretty quick meeting. And uh, we uh, canceled ours without enough attendance. The recruitment. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the recruitment. Okay. What's the third one? Shannon. Shannon, do you want to talk about, since Andrew's not here? Sure. Um, so I was going to ask a question. Sorry, I just got home. I've been in the car for most of the meeting. but. Um, so for recruitment, I'm hoping that our, um, so Jamie, maybe our principals can get together by October and give us some numbers. How many students came in from out of district? How many students from our district have gone out? What districts are they coming in from? Where can we target better? Mm -hmm. Where maybe are we targeting well? I don't know. So that would be really important information. Yeah, I can, we can have that for October. Great. Um, and then for the child care uh, task force, we have not met again since um, since the last school board meeting. We're working on putting in place some 
some of the marching orders that we got at the last meeting. Yeah, we're so extending, at, sorry, so extending things like uh, one planet to 530, those kind of things. Yeah, the facility one, we're, we're due to meet again. Um, we'll schedule something here in the next couple of weeks. I mean, we, the majority of what was on our plate is in front of the board now. Uh, but we will start looking at some of the, the next layer that would be a part of the next budget, not um, that we'll start bringing into play. So I still owe a trip to um, Royalton to meet with the staff down there to get that level of um, uh, building maintenance that we need to look at. So I'll, I'll work on that. Chris has been very helpful. We, we have gone through the athletic program as well as this building so far. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't been to Burlington, so I'll, uh, I'll get that done here in the next week. Or two. Great. We've got a great, great crew over there. Yeah, we do. Okay. Well, then let's uh, move into the summer 2023 heating HVAC and controls update. So. I, I mentioned on it briefly. So right now, Tara's working with Eric Lafayette and uh, me sometimes as I, I swing, swing into. We're just getting all the approvals done that we need to do with the AOE um, around concept approval for the use of ESSER funds. And um, we were locking in on some of the other like ARP ESSER funds and things that we were able to receive for other districts. And you may say, well, Jamie, what's that me mean about RUD? Well, my approach, and I had shared this at the SU level, was to do as many upgrades as we could across every building in the SU around leveraging every grant we could. And so, and then also, so that means ESSER on top of ARP ESSER, which is not just school ESSER, right? Like ARP ESSER opened up a whole nother pot for us. And also there's things like wood chip heating through Efficiency Vermont that we've been able to leverage. And so, what we're doing is, is securing all those funds so that we really know we have it as revenue for these projects. And once we secure that, then the, the plan would be that Eric will come in October or November, once we have all the okays, and really say, here's all the numbers. What else do you need from us to get approval to, to hit go? And remembering to the board, every one of these projects we're doing is the goal is to not have to go and ask for any money right, that we lease. Mm. Uh, also behind the scenes, he's working on getting us the best rate around leasing. We met with the leasing company. You did, yeah, that's what week. I thought. I talked yeah. to Eric today. So those are the updates. Nothing, we're, progress is good. We're continuing to move forward. And I haven't heard anything unless, Terry, you have, but you usually tell me, uh, nothing's been alarming. Like, I feel like we're no. still on the right track to get this Yeah, we're done. writing all of our sole source requests to the Agency of Education, and then all of what Jamie said, the concept approval applications has to be broken down by each individual funding source to the agency, and they have to approve them by funding source. So it's just a lot of organizing and getting the information together. So all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. And did you say that there was a the opportunity maybe to do a little more on the, on the well yeah campus, once we well once we secure what we have for surplus then the board should talk about all right as we're going through the budget process I'm thinking for phase two frankly Chris mm -hmm. like that as we're budgeting how much can we actually put in reserve funds knowing then we could tap those reserve funds to do phase two projects gotcha. yep. and by phase two projects do you mean like the ventilation in the library and stuff. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. that it'd be good to get that done sooner. Or later. Yeah, I just don't want to do it until we know the voters approved us to put the money away. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want us to take action on it this fall for next <coughs> year, and then voters say, well, I don't want to put all that money in reserve. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think we're going to need to educate the voters on why we want to put money in reserves, talk to them about here's the projects we want to support. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but as a board, it's either we either give it back in revenue. <laughs> or they vote to approve that we get to move it in reserves. It's an excellent time to put our money towards the buildings that I agree that you. need it and, and not have to ask for extra money, right? Yep. So. I just think we got to educate them on that and say, oh, by the way, look at all this work we're doing this coming summer mm -hmm. and we're not going to bond for it. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so, I'm yeah, I'm thinking it might be the summer of 24 instead of 23. 
Okay. For a phase two. Two. Right, yeah. I see. So we put it in the reserve fund and then we can put it in our budget and then Yeah. Although well, doesn't the reserve funds can't they just be used outside? You could use them. I just think he needs to know what to order in November. Sure. And so it just seems like a gamble, right? Like in we could say give yeah. the go ahead once we know we have the money to put in reserves in March. I just would hate to sit, I just don't want to lock us up into doing a project mm -hmm. knowing that we don't know if we have the funds to cover it. That's all. Right. Okay. Am I making sense, Peggy and Shannon, what I'm saying? Or you're hearing me okay? Yes, thank okay. you. I feel, I, I'm looking this way because I'm talking to Andrew and Chris. I feel like I'm not looking at you. So. Um. It doesn't look like you're looking at us either way. So okay. Okay. <laughs> we're just yeah. listening to you. Yeah, it would definitely be good to be able to go in front in March and say, you know, we're putting this aside specifically for yep. this. These projects. Yeah. yeah. So. And we'll know. That's the exciting thing. When we were still scoping out the projects when we went in front of folks in March last year, um, I, I feel like we could really say, here's what we want to do with these reserve funds. Yeah. That would make it easier to, to sell. Okay. Um, any other questions about that? Then uh, I don't think we have any action items at the moment. Uh, new hires, resignations. Nothing we want to talk about. No, I mean, I told you the positions we're looking for still. All right. Uh, any public comment? Hi, I'm not sure if I should just take this up with um, the middle school and high school principals. This is Tammy Benoit. Um, I had a question. Um, while I recognize there was a legal concern um, around athletics and the use of team SNAP, and I'll appreciate that it's no longer being used um, because of some legal component and the uh, I can't quote the law, but it was provided to parents in identifying that team SNAP wasn't going to be used. Um, there, while I do recognize that there's a Wildcat Weekly that goes out, it's sent out via email um, and via text. And so I'll acknowledge those components. Um, recognizing the things that we did like about Team Snap and recognizing the things we did not like about Team Snap, is there a new platform being considered or used for those updates? or is it nothing's being considered? I'll recognize that local recs, Bethel and um, Royalton, have began to, begun to use an application that is not TeamSnap, but is similar to that. And so I'm curious as to the dialogue around that. TeamSnap was used for middle school and high school, so this is not a question for the elementary levels. Yeah, well, so, so yeah, so one of the things that I'm trying to get our uh, activities director to do is to have coaches be able to contact families on a weekly basis. So on Sundays, just reaching out to families and letting them know what the schedule is for the week, but also have that information so on a, on a cancellation, that coach is connecting directly to their team. Um, I, I think right now it's the activities director trying to do it all, and I think coaches are going to step up and take that on that responsibility because you're kind of responsible for your teams and it doesn't make sense for if one game is canceled for that uh, blackboard message to go out to all the families. I mean, there's not everyone is involved with that. So it's something that we're going to do better. I did ask Ray Ballou, who also has a communication aspect to his job title. He has been meeting with our new activities director as well right. to figure out what product, Tammy, could meet some of the things we're not meeting right now, um, and how to do it in a way that it's manageable, but making certain that we're getting the information out there. So I would say to you, this has even reached my level as the superintendent in that I do know Tim and Ray have been meeting to try to figure this out. And I saw Parker shake his head as well, because he's Parker's here, Parker is part of the tech team, that the tech team has a component that they're working on with this too with activities. 
Um, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I really felt like, you know, if we were, we were really experiencing technology with that, um, well, I'll recognize it might contribute to that student looking at his or her phone in the classroom. So there's positives and negatives. There's a balance, and I'll recognize that. And so I've, I've in, in my outreach or my um, speaking here today, um, I've recognized positives and negatives, but is there a way that we can make this positive? So, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I feel like the coaches have enough balancing the personalities of our children. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing something coordinator from the activities director and recognize the legalities that um, they're trying to build into that thought process. Shannon had her hand raised, so I'll pass the ball to her. Yeah, Tammy, I'm going to piggyback and, and Tammy and I have, have children on the same team. So she knows my frustrations here that um, one coach in particular asked all of this, all of his athletes for their parents email addresses do you have any idea that my child does not know my email address ah. like he may know <laughs> he may know how to get a hold of me on facebook i don't know but um he doesn't know my email address any more than anyone else so i think that's a challenge i think that um putting it on the students was a bit of a challenge and yeah my student is trying to communicate with me on a day that everything's rained out should he ride the bus home or not so I'm one of those parents who's like, yeah, maybe he needs to use his phone, you know, between seventh and eighth period to let me know how he's getting home because he doesn't have a car yet. Um, he's just a freshman. A freshman. I would also say, and I hope Parker can help with this, it's not just the parents who need to be um, made aware of this. And I like the Blackboard Blast, but also my kiddo has grandparents. He's got two sets of parents now. He's got um, aunts and uncles and cousins. And I'm not, you know, if I'm not getting the message until right before, then I'm not communicating it with them either. We're trying to build a community around the school. So I think when something gets canceled, um, we need to let the community know as well. So I think Facebook blasts, that kind of thing, it makes sense to let everyone know that. And I just wanted to piggyback on this in regards to Fitz, um, that app or another one, you know, the nice things about that was, um, like Shannon was saying, is you could, as a user of that, you could tag other members. So you could have family, you could have whatever, you know, 15 family members that would all receive that information instantly. It was also nice yeah. about uh, buses when they come back, especially if it's late. Um, there would be a blast that would go out and say the bus will be there in 15, 20 minutes or something. So there was yeah. a lot of really good features yeah. about it. And if yeah. there is some kind of technological component or app that we can use, that would, that would just be yeah. nice. I mean, yeah. I don't, I, again, I apologize. I didn't read the, uh, the blurb that came out on it, but um, for, for whatever reason, why we're not using it. But um, if we could get something similar, it would be very nice. And, and I think there's other opportunities to use it, not just athletics, but you could use it for events and other things that, you know, that you could sign up to. So. All right. Um, so future agenda items, we talked about having an update from the, on, on the for anti bullying efforts. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a future event item. Yeah. Uh, and enrollment um, information. And then our next meeting date is Tuesday, October 18th at 6.30 p.m. at the Royalton campus. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Peggy. Okay, I'm, I know I'm kind, kind of late with this because I was having technical issues, but... Um, I was presented with a very, I shall say, informal petition from some junior high students. Um, apparently the scheduling or something has been changed and they're very upset that it has been changed so that I guess some of their, I guess I'd call them extra, extra topics like uh, phys ed and so on. Uh, they're having, instead of having it maybe once a week, 
they won't they'll have it maybe five days a week but only for a couple of weeks and then they switch to another thing so some children aren't getting phys ed until i don't know for for several weeks and so they're kind of upset about the new scheduling i got that i can respond to that peggy i'm really glad they did a petition though that's awesome student voice <laughs> It's a scheduling issue, and it's also, you know, uh, having enough people. They will have six to seven weeks of what we call essentials. They've been called specials, explorations, lots of things. So they'll have something for six to seven weeks, five days a week. And they won't have it again until the, uh, later in the year. So this makes sure every kid gets everything. One of the things we were finding was kids were having trouble switching five times a week. So they'd have art, they'd have PE, they would have outdoor ed. So keeping track of that was hard in some ways. This is not a perfect, but we're going to try it. And we're open to tweaking it. I think I know maybe some of the people that filled out your petition. <laughs> And I know one of them is lovely and has stayed in chorus. But we, I'll follow up with them if you want. But uh, there's not an easy answer. It's a very complicated thing to move all of that around, as you might imagine. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I understand that. And, yes, I, your bribe worked for chorus. <laughs> but <laughs> she tried but I, I, I am concerned, especially when it comes to phys ed. Okay. I mean, I really feel kids, I mean, I feel they should be having phys ed every day. So they um, have, yes, I, I agree. We need more physical activity for middle school students. Yes. They get 30 minutes of exercise a day, every day at their break. It's longer than any recess that we offer in any parts of the school. And we know they need that and want that. Two times a week, they're out with their pods. So we had worked, I had talked with um, some folks about this, and we looked at what the state requires, and we feel like we're easily meeting that need. But I hear what you're saying. It's not a formal class every day in physical education. We're also building it into other places through the flexible pathways model, and we're also having kids, we know a bunch of kids do a bunch of stuff on their own and we want them to document that too with with physical activity i hope this is helpful well she's been listening so i hope it's helpful too <laughs> do your homework okay thank you thank you all right unless there's anything else i think uh entertain a motion to adjourn so moved Second that? I'll second. Okay. Then Thank you. <laughs> meeting to a close at 747. Thanks, everybody. Good night.